Good morning, everyone. My name is David Frosch, and welcome to what we anticipate to be a really great hour together. Uh, David Kilcullen and John Rutledge are going to take turns providing a general overview um, on the key topics of today. And uh, once they get done, we've got some designated uh, folks that are going to ask some questions and some follow-up questions. I have known both these guys and grateful to call them uh, good friends for a while now. And, uh, but the two of them just met a couple of months ago. We had lunch together and they hit it off so well. We had a lot of fun and I got to thinking with all that's going on in the world, it would be great to get the two of them uh, together on a call. Uh, both uh, David and John are um, PhDs. Uh, they both written multiple books. John and David have given back through government service their whole life, along with being very successful in the private sector. John has advised most U.S. administrations on economic issues since his days in the Reagan White House. John was one of the architects of Reaganomics and was on the front line 40 years ago, fighting inflation the last time we faced these kind of issues. He's an expert on China, the Middle East, North Korea. John is a regular in CNBC, was a Fox News contributor for years. He teaches still a few very lucky PhD students at Claremont and has overseen billions in real estate equities markets, and private equity transactions. David grew up in Australia. Uh, he has uh, started his career on the front line in special forces and in, was an intelligence officer in his early years. After 9-11 happened, David was one of the few people in the world that actually had deep knowledge of ISIS. And uh, he was tapped by Condoleezza Rice in the State Department, and he was leading our counterinsurgency efforts. And then David later worked for General Petraeus in both Iraq and Afghanistan, David uh, is considered one of the world experts on counterterrorism, the expert on counterterrorism, and has been working hard to reinvent how NATO and the U.S. approaches modern warfare. Uh, many of you met David a few months back um, in person here in Newport Beach, hearing a firsthand account of the debacle in Afghanistan and the pullout. David's team got 2,000 people out in a very short period of time. It's an amazing story, and they saved a lot of lives. His team has also been on the front line um, helping with the tactics and strategies the Ukrainians have been using to fight the Russians. So to both of you, a sincere thank you for doing this. And David, you got the floor. Thanks so much, David. And, and you know, thanks for having me. Um, uh, it's great to be back. Um, let me get straight into it. So in October of 2020, the head of the British Intelligence Service, MI5, a guy called Ken McCallum, said, um, if the question is, which country's intelligence services cause us the most aggregation right now? The answer is Russia. But if the question is which state is going to be shaping the conditions globally in the next generation or two, it's China. And he said, you might think about the Russians as giving us bursts of bad weather while quietly behind the scenes, the Chinese are changing the climate. So the weather's obviously pretty bad right now. Um, and so understandably, most people's focus has been on Russia, on Ukraine, uh, the impact on global commodities, oil, gas, neon, wheat, and so on, um, the risk of a nuclear exchange or a direct conventional war between the US and NATO um, and Russia. And that's absolutely super important in terms, terms of acute uh, short-term impact. So we're gonna talk about that in a minute, but I think we also need to think about the climate, right? The, the impact of the current disruption on the rise of China, um, the US relationship with China, the impact of, of our reaction to what's going on in Ukraine uh, on broader geopolitical uh, and geoeconomic issues. So we're, we're gonna talk, touch on those as well. Um, as a lot of people know on the call, my team at Cordillera focuses very much on predictive anal analysis of, of defense, aerospace, and urban technologies and markets. And, how those intersect with um, geopolitical and economic risk. And we tend to look for sort of undervalued or underappreciated innovation that can transform the big macro trends. And interestingly, the last two months has been just a massive injection of reality into what's historically been quite a poorly informed discussion, um, particularly across a financial sector that's paid a lot less attention to these sorts of non-ESG issues or real economy issues. Um, than to other factors of late. So hopefully we'll get into some of that in the Q&A. So let me start with Russia and Ukraine. Initial observation, you know, the truism that weakness is provocative, right? What we just saw in Ukraine was a major failure of Western deterrence where Russia watched our debacle in Afghanistan last year. They watched the turmoil and instability in the US 
They saw that their build up in 2021 in Ukraine uh, got them rewarded with a summit with President Biden last June um, and a variety of concessions from European leaders. And they decided, you know what, let's go for it. Um, and I think that failure of Western deterrence let Putin think he could throw out the Crimea playbook, if you like, the sort of limited, incremental, grey zone, uh, so-called so hybrid warfare model that was actually working very well for the Russians up until uh, this February. Um, and it turns out, and one of the other big lessons is that economic sanctions turned out to have very little deterrent effect, even though that's become our sort of one trick pony of our preferred tool for dealing with aggression uh, of late. Banking sanctions, in particular, cutting Russia out of SWIFT, had an initial effect, um, but the ruble rapidly recovered. Um, Russia linked it to the price of oil uh, and to gold reserves, and it's now trading above where it was in February. Arguably, the, one of the big risks from that was the risk of blowback on the US dollar's reserve status. Um, you know, when a currency is no longer seen as safe, in other words, you know, immune to politically motivated disruptions, people start to move away from it. And we've seen that over several years already as Russia, China, and others have started to de-dollarize their trade. But in the wake of the Ukraine banking sanctions, we started to see, you know, Saudi Arabia selling oil to uh, China with payment in yuan. We saw China buying coal from Russia in rubles and later in yuan. So arguably there's, there's a potential, and it may take a long time, that the reserve status of the US dollar starts to be affected a little bit by the weaponization of um, currency controls and, and the banking system. I think the reason the Russians underestimated the risk of sanctions was they probably thought the war would be over in about three to five days. So quickly enough that, um, that the sanctions wouldn't have time to bite. And frankly, that could have actually happened, except that on the very first morning of the war uh, at a place called Hostomel Airport outside Ukrainian capital of Kyiv, um, the uh, initial air assault that the Russians tried to put in to seize that airfield and then fly rapidly uh, reinforcements uh, in and, and follow up with a, an armored thrust on the ground, that failed. Um, if that thrust had succeeded, there probably would have been tanks in downtown Kyiv by mid-morning on the first day of the war, but it failed, uh, largely due to Ukrainian special forces and, and a, uh, a bit of, in, of US and, and British support, which enabled them to defeat that initial move. It then took the Russians about a week to come up with a plan B, which itself had failed by the end of March. They're now on plan C or D, I'm lost count. Uh, and that in turn looks like it's grinding to a halt. I'll just say the Ukrainians are doing very well, but much less well than you might think just by watching Western media. In fact, they've lost a lot of people and equipment, um, dramatically more so actually as a proportion of what they had at the start of the war um, than the Russians have. So a, a lot of people are expecting Ukrainian successful counterattack and, and victory here. I think it's much more likely that the war turns into a stalemate and becomes a protracted conflict rather than a, a Ukrainian victory. Meanwhile, the US and NATO are now effectively co-belligerents uh, alongside Ukraine in all but name. I mean, last week's US uh, Ukraine Lend Lease Act um, was a good example. And that, of course, brings the risk of direct conflict with Russia um, or what we call horizontal escalation, whether the conflict widens geographically or goes into other sectors like cyberspace or economic warfare. Impacts of that on US inflation, particularly in terms of the producer price index, um, could potentially be very significant. And I'll leave it to John to expand on, on that particular piece, but let me just give you one concrete example. Probably the sort of rock star um, weapon system of the war so far, as far as Western media has portrayed it, is a weapon called the FGM-148, otherwise known as the Javelin missile. It's made by Lockheed Martin uh, and Raytheon in the US and it has really proven its worth against Russian armored vehicles. Uh, the missile warhead costs about $240,000. Um, a reusable uh, command launch unit that goes with it is about another 250K. Each of those warheads has more than 200 semiconductors in the warhead. Normal production is about 4,000 missiles per year. We have given almost five times that number, so about five times our annual production of javelins, to Ukraine in just the last two months. 
and our allies have given about half that amount. So call it in total roughly seven times or seven years of a manufacturing pipeline that's already maxed out producing weapons that we need ourselves. Um, and the inputs to that process, semiconductors, rare earths, copper, cobalt, lithium, all of those are at a premium already, and they all feature very heavily um, in the Javelin system. And many of those commodities are either threatened by China, for example, TSMC makes the semiconductors that we're talking about, or they're even controlled by China, um, for example, rare earths. So turning to China real quickly, China was already in an economic slowdown um, before the latest COVID outbreak. Real estate crisis, credit crunch, uh, government over-regulation of the tech sector, very heavy-handed bullying of Chinese entrepreneurs, uh, capital controls uh, on Western countries amid an exodus of talent from China, um, lack of water and energy, overproduction of housing, all kinds of structural issues. And in particular, the collapse of China's real estate bubble is a very big deal indeed, because that's 29% of China's total GDP. Um, and inputs to that construction and real estate sector drive a lot of commodity prices globally, particularly you know, down under. Um, China's population's peaking, um, it's aging rapidly, its workforce is shrinking, uh, productivity stalling. The Lowy Institute down in Australia recently predicted that China would be down to about 3% growth in productivity by 2030 and 2% by 2050. So, you know, what has been one of the world's growth engines is starting to slow down. And now the sort of COVID zero policies resulting in mass lockdowns are further exacerbating that slowdown. You know, 26 out of 31 Chinese provinces right now have spiking COVID rates. At one point, a couple of weeks ago, 400 million Chinese were locked in their apartments. Major ports, including Shanghai, are massively disrupted, and that's further dislocating a global supply chain and a shipping system that was already in a severe imbalance uh, due to COVID. Now, part of that is political, right? The Shanghai lockdown was partially an attempt by the Beijing faction of the Communist Party around Xi Jinping to punish and weaken their rival uh, faction around Jiang Zemin uh, in Shanghai ahead of this critical 20th Party Congress this, this November that will either reappoint Xi Jinping or move to a successor. So it's a critical moment um, in Chinese politics right now. And China, in the midst of all that, is watching Ukraine very closely, um, drawing a lot of lessons on conflict and the future of, of conflict and also on their, their chances for success in reintegrating Taiwan, which remains a really important national um, and political goal. They have almost certainly pushed back the calendar on any direct attack on Taiwan as a result of watching the failure of the Russian effort. Um, it might have even reinforced China's existing tendency to focus on gray zone, indirect, um, unrestricted warfare. That said, um, China has been particularly aggressive in the Taiwan Strait. They just got done running basically a, an invasion rehearsal drill um, or where they almost surrounded uh, Taiwan and they actually pushed a US warship um, out of that area when the US tried to uh, send a ship in there. Uh, they're ramping up their activity in the South China Sea. They just signed uh, uh, a security pact with the Solomon Islands in the South Pacific. They're even sending naval ships into Australian uh, coastal waters. There was a, an incident a month or so ago where two Navy Chinese Navy warships uh, shone lasers uh, against the pilots of Australian maritime patrol aircraft just off Australia's northern coast. Um, now, Ukraine has also caused Taiwan to focus more on resistance and so-called um, total people's defense. But it's diverting a lot of military assets away from Taiwan's rearmament program that it's been engaging in for the last year or so. As one example, last month, uh, the US government told Taiwan that we won't be able to deliver on a purchase of artillery systems that Taiwan had bought because those artillery systems are now going to Ukraine. Uh, the Taiwanese are looking for alternatives, but it'll probably take a while, potentially years, uh, to put those in place. Long term, uh, China is going to continue to pose that sort of climate change of the geopolitical and, and geoeconomic threat to the US uh, and to, to allies, even though Russia is dominating the bad weather um, of right now. Taiwan um, and more broadly, 
overtaking the US in terms of global influence is very much on the agenda for China for the next decade. Uh, a weakened Russia and an EU or a US that are distracted by a new Cold War with Vladimir Putin gives them a lot of opportunity there. So there's a lot more that we could talk about, um, and I hope we get to that in Q&A. But just respectful of time, I'm going to throw now to John Rutledge, and I'm very happy when we get back to dive into any and all of, of those things we've talked about um, in much more detail. So uh, with that, over to you, John. <laughs> 